so-called Islamic State group has targeted more world heritage remains at Palmyra, including a part of the Roman amphitheater, and also a part of a four-column tetrapylon structure, much of which is a replica built in the 1960s. Satellite images show the extent of the destruction. It is believed the jihadists have also carried out executions close to the archaeological site. They were forced out of the ancient city last March, but regained it when Russian and Syrian forces were concentrating their efforts on gaining full control of Aleppo, 300 kilometers to the north. The Russians can't be in two places at once, in the north and in Palmyra, which was left to Syrian troops to protect. There are fewer Russian forces present, and safeguarding the site was down much more to Damascus, and it's proved once again it's not able to hold on to territory. It is an embarrassing loss for Vladimir Putin. The Russian president appeared on a giant screen during celebrations marking the city's capture from the jihadists last spring. The Assad government is once again trying to regain the city. Its troops are nearby. But time is of the essence. The site was already partially destroyed during the months the jihadists took control before and is vulnerable once again. It was once one of the most important centers of the ancient world. وين ما نقدر نوقف على البسطة طاول والبسطة فيها نوعين من الرزق ثلاث أنواع تشكيلة بس بقدونس ونعناع وفجل ورشيد هلا الحمد لله أسعار كتير كويسة ورزق كله يعني الزبون زبونات عم تزود ما عم تنقص الحمد لله رب العالمين هلا الأمور اختلفت هلا يعني هلا صارت امام تطلع الساعة ايمد من كان تطلع مأمنة على حالك مأمنة على حالك يعني ظروف ال هلا المعيشة بدها شوي تدريجيا يعني يعني نحن هلا الحطب قلت لك هالصوب وعندي الولد كلنا ابو من بلم لي كيس عم ندفى ماشي الامور in Syria now, where battles are escalating between Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists and militants from other factions. The first to attack were rebels from the Fatah al-Sham front, previously known as the al-Nusra militants. Uh, the group issued a statement saying its attacks on opposition groups were to prevent a conspiracy. In response, one of the major militant groups, Arar al-Sham, said it's ready to fight back. Tensions inside the anti-Assad forces are escalating as various militant factions decide to turn on each other and go head to head. As Daniel Hawkins explains. The Syrian civil war is a melee of dozens of fronts and factions with different objectives. We hear about the key flashpoints, Al-Bab, Damascus, Aleppo. But let's focus for a minute on the province of Idlib, the only one in western Syria where the government has almost no military presence. As you can see, it's a patchwork of armed groups with fluid allegiances. They can be united one week and at war with each other the next. It's also a microcosm of Syria to which, following truce agreements, rebels have been transported from all the surrounding areas. It's a picture of what the rest of the country could look like without the Syrian army and Assad government. What does that mean? Well, separating moderate rebels from terrorists has been a key tenet of Russian policy in Syria. With Assad as a common enemy, there seemed to be some unity among contending factions. But take him out of the equation and true colours start to emerge. The recent chaos in Idlib has proven just that. As the prospect of a political process and resolution becomes more realistic, infighting between extremist groups and more moderate factions has intensified in the region. When you look at um, 
the conference that just happened in Kazakhstan, and you see, you know, the governments are, are you know, have come together. They were able to essentially speak with one voice. Uh, and you compare that to what's going on in Idlib, um, and you basically have a cacophony of uh, Salafist rebel groups of varying degrees of extremeness who are now fighting each other. The main divide in Idlib seems to be between the Al-Qaeda affiliate Nusra there um, and slightly more moderate groups. And then there are groups that are sort of in between in terms of how moderate they are. I do think that this conference has exacerbated tensions on the ground between the rebel groups. And in a way, this is what Russia has been demanding, is for the more moderate rebels to try to disentangle themselves. A clearer picture is now emerging of which groups really are willing and able to participate in a negotiated solution, and those who put ideology above all else. A natural way of separating the wheat from the chaff. Well, uh, separating uh, so-called moderate rebels from jihadists and militants in Syria has been a bit of a problem the old U.S. administration either seemed unable or reluctant to solve. Um, we recognize that, you know, uh, in places like Aleppo and elsewhere, that there's uh, a mixing or commingling, whatever you want to call it, um, and that we need to work more closely together to uh, disentangle, uh, you know, where these groups are mixing with, uh, with known terrorist uh, groups. These rebel groups have to know that there is no military solution for them, that there is no way that they can win uh, by taking up arms. And this is where the Americans have to come in, because not only must Donald Trump's administration not try to impede this process, but it must start pu putting pressure on U.S. regional allies by continuing to funnel weapons and, uh, and, and money and support to the rebel groups. So this is where the U.S. can come in under Trump. It can choke off this regional support. A monitoring group says Syrian government forces and their allies have pushed back Daesh militants near Aleppo over the past two days. The so-called Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says the militants were flushed out of several villages northeast of Aleppo between Tuesday and Wednesday. The UK-based group says Syrian army's advances in the past week have brought the troops within eight kilometers of the town of Al-Bab. The Daesh-held town is close to territories controlled by Turkish-backed militia. Last week, the Syrian army began a new wave of attacks to recapture the city. Observatory director Rami Abdulrahman describes the renewed assaults as a race to liberate the city before the Turkish side gets there. The change of U.S. policy seems to be in the making as President Donald Trump orders the development of safe zones in Syria for refugees fleeing war. I'll absolutely do safe zones in Syria for the people. I think that Europe has made a tremendous mistake by allowing these millions of people to go into Germany and various other countries. And all you have to do is take a look. It's, it's a disaster what's happening over there. Well, it's very confused what uh, uh, Mr. Trump actually had in mind. I, I'm afraid he's not very well informed on the whole general situation. Well, I mean, does he not know that there are already safe zones and camps run by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in, in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon? I mean, there already are safe zones. So does he then mean safe zones inside Syria? Well, if that's done under UN auspices with the agreement of the Syrian government, uh, that would be fine. But it, it seems to be uh, really warming up of an old idea that Hillary Clinton and other people have had during the Obama time, which was to set up uh, no-fly zones, which uh, really amount to an act of war, because that would be taking action on a foreign in a foreign country's territory without its agreement and trying to police it. And, and that could bring about clashes between American aircraft and uh, Syrian government aircraft or Russian aircraft if they're in the same area. So it could be very dangerous.